Like you said, my name is Chad Schimmel. Uh, I own Turner's Warehouse here in Arizona. Uh, nice and warm here. I'm sure you guys are still enjoying cool weather um, in Texas there, but it is hot here. So if I start sweating, that's why I'm not working that hard. It's just hot. Um, but what we do at Turner's Warehouse, we are primarily a wood turning store. We do a lot of pen turning, a lot of ring making, and a lot of resin casting. So the ring making kind of just fits in well with lathe work. You're not going to turn a lot like with tools, as you'll see, but you'll use your lathe and it, it's really a fun project that you can do fairly quickly. Uh, rings are really a simple project. And what's nice about it, they're kind of like pens where you can start and finish in a relatively short amount of time, make something really nice, but it doesn't tie you up for weeks on end like other woodworking projects do. So it's, it's kind of a cool, unique thing. Um, and I'm just going to show you the inlay technique. I'm going to specifically show you abalone uh, inlay, the shell. And you can do the same technique with anything that will fit in the channel. And I'll kind of go over that here in a sec. So I'm going to start by showing you guys some examples of different materials and different rings and how we do the inlay. So I'm going to go over to the table and we're going to do that. All right. So what I've got set up here is my ring maker station. So this little wood gadget here uh, is just made to hold everything. It's nice because you can kind of pick it all up and move it somewhere convenient and everything goes with you. And what it allows you to do is use your mandrels for making the ring, not just finishing the ring on the lathe. So this, this arm holds up your mandrel and you can do your inlay. If you happen to drop anything, it falls right in the tray here and it, it's pretty simple. Now, in terms, in terms of what you can inlay, the beauty is, I always tell people, if it'll fit in the channel, you can use it as an inlay. So this is, this is some of the examples, and I'll kind of try to hold this up. So you've got different types of rings and then also different inlays. Uh, for example, opal, uh, this is watch parts, which is a real popular one. Uh, we do a lot of pens with that. The watch parts kind of came natural. Uh, different color opal. This is a stone. A lot of people like to use a sand or a stone from a vacation or somewhere significant, maybe like a family place. Uh, really anything, you can inlay it in there and it kind of looks cool. This is abalone shell. Uh, turquoise, obviously I'm in Arizona, so there's a lot of turquoise stuff. This is uh, canary and lapis. And then you've got malachite and lapis and then a real thin abalone here just to show kind of different types of rings. And along those lines, there's different materials for the ring. So this white one is actually made of ceramic. So there's no metal in it, it's all ceramic. And if you've never worked with ceramic, it's, I would say it's a hard, somewhat brittle material. It's very hard, you're not gonna break it, just normal use, but if you put it on this mandrel and really tighten up, you know, pushing out, you'll crack it. Uh, We've got stainless steel and tungsten and then titanium, which you probably can't really tell a difference on the video. The tungsten's really heavy, which is nice. Um, but the reason we sell these different types is it gives you a lot of options and everything we sell can be turned on the lathe and you can sand without worrying about sanding off a metal finish or a plating. These are all solid. So solid tungsten, solid stainless steel, solid titanium and the ceramic. So when you see me polishing and sanding, I'm not worried about the edges because all I'm gonna do is sand them and then essentially polish them. So that's kind of a cool thing. With that comes- Chad, I yeah, have a question. What is the approximate dimensions of the channel? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. I'm actually gonna explain that now. So within every ring type, this happens to be stainless. There's different channel widths. And this is a four millimeter, try not to drop these, a four millimeter, a six millimeter, and an eight millimeter. And it's really, it doesn't make any difference to you, the maker. It's really just the end user's preference. And not all, but a lot of ladies like thinner rings uh, versus some, a lot of guys like wider rings. So it's just kind of a preference of each person. The six millimeter, the middle one, is probably the most popular though, because it's kind of like in between. But 
I just made my mom, she really loves a thin ring. So I just made her an abalone shell four millimeter and it, she really loves that. She wouldn't necessarily like a big chunky ring. So it's really the user. And then of course, within each of those different widths, there's all the different sizes. So like at Turner's Warehouse, we have from size like four and a half up to 17, um, which is just a huge range of sizes when you throw in all the half sizes. And then within each size, there's all these different widths. So we have thousands of rings on the wall and that's why, because there's so many different types. And the, you know, the, the person you're making it for, you'll need to know their size, that's you know, key, but they might like it lighter versus heavier. So tungsten is just a shade darker of a metal, but it's really heavy. It's about three times the weight. So they may not want a heavy ring. They may want something that's light. Stainless is a good choice for that, or even the, the ceramic if they like a color. But there's really endless options to this. And then you start mixing in all the types of inlay materials, and it, you can really sky's the limit. Now, I'll give you guys an idea of cost, because I know we all are always curious about that. A ring core like this, at least at our store, they're, these are six bucks. So they're not super expensive and, you know, compared to a lot of things. And when you add your inlay material, like I'm going to do one of these with an abalone, I'll have less than a dollar, maybe 50 cents worth of shell in here. So I'll be into this for seven bucks. Let's count a dollar of resin, even though it's going to be a fraction of that, you know, eight dollars. And I'll have a ring that's really nice that could sell for a lot more or be a great gift if you're if you're giving them away. One of the guys that works here at the shop bought his setup, which um, includes all this stuff, and they're around 129 bucks. And he that night he posted his first ring and it sold for $100. So he basically recouped his the setup money on the first sale, and he wasn't even trying to sell anything. He just posted it on Instagram. Um, so that's the ring side of it. Now the inlay side of it is is pretty endless. The most popular things are opal because opals give you color with a real amazing shimmer. These are all uh, man-made opals by Kyocera, which are some of the best out there. And there's, there's like 90 colors of opal. We have about 30 here. So there's a lot of choices there. And if you're doing these double channel rings, you could do two colors. So you have even more and more options. Uh, this is abalone shell. This is a real fine crushed shell, whoops. Just dump some on the table. I'll use that in the ring maybe. Uh, that's a real fine stuff. And then we have other kinds that are slightly larger chunks. And you would the reason you would pick this one over this one or vice versa is if you're doing a, a four millimeter, you're not gonna get these big chunks into there, but these, these pieces fit really nicely. You can also use the larger chunks and then fit the smaller pieces around it to really fill it in and make it look nice and full. One thing I'll give you a tip if you've not done these is the fuller you make the ring as far as the material, typically the better it looks. I'm sure there's cases where that's not true, but in this case, it's, it's mostly always true. So you, you need to pick your inlay after you've got your ring and the size, and then um, you do a background. Now here's a black painted background, which I'm going to show you in just a sec. And this is a gold leaf background. So you can really step up the materials and, and you know, pick things that really tailor it to you. I don't know a lot of people that use a gold leaf background. You could just as easily use gold paint, but nothing quite shines like gold leaf in my opinion. So I, I like to do the extra step and do a little extra work to get that gold. If I'm doing a material that needs that gold behind it. So that's just an example of that. And then the other things you're gonna need for this, uh, and I say need, not required, but nice, are obviously the mandrels. There's two, typically two sizes for most rings. If you have an extremely large or an extremely small, uh, you may have to find other options as well. But this, these two mandrels cover most of the sizes. And then uh, you need, a, what we use is UV resin. You can, you can use a CA or um, a two-part epoxy, but it'll change your, the way you make the ring a lot. And I'll go over that here in just a second when we start doing it. But I use the, the, two, or the uh, UV resin from Illumilite. We carry this at Turner's Warehouse 
and I'll show you why we do that here in just a sec. So just if anybody has any questions on the front page of turnerswarehouse.com, the very first thing I put ring demo and I put all this stuff in there. So if later on you're like, hey, what was that thing called? You can go there and probably find it because all this, all these tools and equipment are right there. So if you have questions, let me know, but that might help if you are looking for a material or a, a resin or whatever later. So just wanted to throw that out there. Now, uh, the other thing you'll need since we're using UV resin is a black light, uh, specifically a UV light. Uh, this is a solar res light, which are a great light, but they're a little pricey. Uh, we have this Tau electronics light that works really well. Either one of them will do the job. And with UV resin, there's a couple of really key tips that I'll share so you don't have to learn them the hard way. Uh, one is always put your lid back on your bottle because if you leave this sitting with the lid open, you're exposing it to light. And if you accidentally bring that UV light over the front of it, the top of it, you're gonna cure the surface in here and pretty quick actually. So I always pour a little out and then put the lid back on the bottle. That's why the bottle's brown so that it doesn't get any light in it. And I actually go one step further and I pour a little bit into these amber jars because I happen to have these laying around and then I can pour them out really easy and I don't have to worry about accidentally spilling or curing my big jar. So that's what I do. And here, I'm gonna give you guys a little example. If you've never used UV resin, it's kind of a cool thing. And I find myself using it in a lot of other like pen turning applications and other little woodworking things because it's almost like a glue and a resin combination because you can fill voids with it. I, I have a, a demo video where I show, I laser some pen blanks and then I fill it with stone and, and I put UV resin on it and cure it. But you can see it's liquid, you know, I'm brushing it around. But if I put my black or my, U, my I always say black light, but it's a UV light. If I put the UV light on it for just a few seconds, it'll harden it. Now it's gonna get hot. So if it's on your fingers, be very careful not to cure it while you're, you know, have wet stuff on your fingers because it hurts, it gets hot when it cures, it's a reaction. But from before you saw I was brushing it, it's hard as a rock now. So that's like a hard spot. So what's really cool is if you had a turning, you could, that had a, a big gap in it, you could fill this in, cure it, and then go back and sand it. And it would be, you know, perfectly filled in and relatively quick. And you don't have to worry about, you know, foaming and things like that with CA. So all of this could be done with CA, but it would be a little more difficult. So that's kind of the basic uh, tools and setups. I like to have a couple of brushes around. Typically I'll use a, a thinner brush, but I'm using larger brushes just because I had a few laying around. Actually, I think I just cured that. Did anybody catch? Did I run the <laughs> light over that? Because it's, I think when I was showing the light, I put the brush under it. Now it's stiff. So I'll set that one aside. I have another one here ready. I do typically have this little pointer prod thing. Uh, it's a soldering tip, but I like it for this because I can really get in there and move pieces around in the resin before I cure it. And it, it allows me to do that without a big, heavy tip. That's, again, not necessary, but nice. Is there, a way, I, to, me, is there, a, is there a way to uh, clean it? Like um, the brush? You know, there probably is, but I haven't. I haven't experimented to see what you would use for that. Uh, typically I use brushes that are, are relatively inexpensive and I'll use them for several applications until I accidentally do something like I just did. Um, so I'll get a lot of use out of them even though they're really cheap brushes. And uh, you know, worst case you, you cure it, but, and actually you can still use it after it's cured because you're really not using it for the sake of the brush. You're just using it as a, a means to pick up some of the liquid and, and move it. So it would still work even though it's it's kind of, you know, cured up a little bit. I could still dip it in the resin and use it. But yeah, I haven't tried to clean it. I'm sure something would, acetone or thinner or something. I don't know. I just haven't tried that. You said so, you use it for several applications. How do you store your brushes in between applications? Uh, typically, I'll put them... I'll wrap a little foil around it and I just keep it on my workbench in the back so it's out of the light. My shop has uh, four big skylights and if I'm working out under the skylight, it's nice because I can see really well, but I notice my resin starts to get really gel really fast and that 
skylight is just like curing it as I pull it out. So I actually kind of, when I do this a lot, you know, not for demos, I tuck myself into my workbench and I have it covered to where I, I'm not getting a ton of natural light because it'll cure it. Same thing if you were working by a window or something and, and a, a lot of good light is coming in, it's nice. But in this case, you'd want to be a little careful so you don't cure everything. Hmm. Yeah. But essentially, even if you didn't cover the brush, as long as no UV light hit it, it wouldn't, it would stay soft. It might get dirty or something, but it would stay soft. So it's kind of a unique product that way. But there's a key feature of being able to cure it quickly or move it around and use it as long as you want until you do cure it. That makes it really nice for this application. So this is the other thing I use a lot are uh, magnifiers. You know, getting up in age, the stuff seems to get further away. So I like to really get up close with it. Even when I pen turn, I always have my face right up there by the barrel when I'm when I'm doing stuff. So I like to get right up on it. And these really help, especially uh, if you're doing these little tiny abalone chips or opals, because you're not just dumping stuff into the channel. You want to actually try to place it. And the difference between, you know, dumping the material in or placing it really shows in the final work and the quality of how it looks. And I would actually say, if you're going to do this, try both ways so you can see the difference and it'll really help you appreciate it. So you what we're going to do first. You sell those okay. magnifying uh, uh, glasses on your site? Uh, I don't have those, unfortunately. I think I got those on Amazon. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and they're, they're kind of nice because they actually have a little LED light. So you can uh, get some light right in front of your face as well. So I, I wear those a lot and I look a little goofy in them, but it helps so much. I don't care. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to make a, we're going to make an abalone shell ring. And this is what we're going for here. This is a larger, I'd say, I call it a chunkier shell versus um, one I did a little bit ago has the smaller pieces. So they both look good. In my opinion, I always like to use the biggest piece, whether it be abalone shell or opal or whatever. I like to use the biggest piece I can to fill in the space because typically I'll get more color. It'll show up better. Uh, smaller pieces look cool, but they, they don't represent it as well. Like a lot of these pieces, you see it and go, oh, that's an abalone shell, you know, no problem. The smaller pieces, sometimes it just looks really cool, but you're not exactly sure right away what you're looking at. So that's why I choose the bigger pieces. So today I'm going to use some of the small and then some of these larger, which we actually call these small. These come from Easy Inlay. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Scott. Um, these are the small. We have medium and large. You can get large and break them up, but it's so nice to have these small ones. I'll, I'll be using a lot of these. And then I'll fill in around with the small the micro, I would call it stuff. But the first thing we need to do is background. So I was talking about different backgrounds and I experimented a lot when I first started doing rings with different backgrounds. And, you know, like this one is a white opal. So if I put a black background behind it, it's going to really kill the white color of the opal. It's going to make it really dark. And that may be something you're going for. So you can experiment by painting on either wood or paper scraps and then putting some of the opal or whatever the material is to see how the background looks. And that kind of gives you an idea of how you want it to come out in the end. So this one had a white background. Obviously we talked about the gold leaf and for abalone, I've done a few different colors and black is my favorite. So I'm going to do black and all I'm using is nail polish. There's the white, and then this is actually a kind of a blue green that I use for uh, some of the different opals. And you don't have to use expensive nail polish. I'm sure you could use other paints like model paint or you know anything that's really durable. You want it strong, something that won't get soft easily. But what I like to do, I'm gonna do this six millimeter. Actually, we'll do the eight so we can do some nice big pieces today. And you guys are going to get this ring for next week's or next month's raffle. So this will be a cool one. This is a size nine. And I just stuck it on my mandrel here. 
And the reason I, ha I have it like this is so I can spin it. And I, I want to paint it. And the key is you want a nice, even paint job. And you don't want it to be clumpy. You don't want a lot of excess. You want to coat it, though. And you want to get the sides, the inside of the channel, you want to get those sides all the way up the ring. If you have spots of silver on the inside of the channel, you're going to see that in your ring because it's going to be clear and it's not going to quite look right. So we want to do it all the way up there. I like to apply a coat, look around my, I just rotate it and I see a big spot I missed right there. I just rotate it around looking at the whole edge and then I'll flip it and do the same thing. And if you see any spots, just catch them right there. Now the beauty is, you probably noticed I wasn't super careful. Um, if I get ring on the outside, it doesn't matter a bit. I don't have to worry about it right now. I don't have to try to take it off or anything because when we do the sanding and polishing, we're gonna clean up the whole thing. So this is a kind of a fun project because when you're done with the inlay and the resin and the painting, your ring might really look a mess. Your ring might really look a mess, but your sanding and your painting, or I'm sorry, your sanding and your polishing is really going to bring it to life. And it's kind of a fun thing to watch it come out. So I, I, can, uh, I can actually use my UV light to, to help the paint cure faster. But I'm going to go ahead and jump to another one that I have ready. I stuck it in the display over here. How funny. Okay, so here's my here's my one I just painted a, a little bit ago for the demo. Uh, so I'll just let this dry and this is the exact same thing ready to go. So I'm going to stick it on here. I don't typically these these mandrels have a uh, bolt that goes through the front and it basically as you screw it in it apl it applies pressure and it pushes out on the mandrel to hold the ring, especially for the glue up. I'm going to move this over a little bit. Especially for the glue up, you don't need that because it'll just hold it in place. The tension, it's kind of like spring loaded in here and it's pushing out. Um, so I'm not going to worry about having a super secure tight fit on that. I'm going to open these and you can see I put these in this little tray for a reason. Not that I've ever dumped them on the floor, which I have several times. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible but it really makes it easy for what I'm gonna do here because I'm gonna basically pick up the pieces and go right to this. Now, this is a little tiny brush, so I'm actually gonna probably use this bigger brush that I cured because these pieces are a little heavier and that little tiny brush isn't gonna have enough resin on it to, to allow me to dip it and pick up the pieces, which this one is. But I'm just gonna pour a little bit of resin. You can pour it on a scrap paper. Uh, I'm using the bag from the ring uh, anything you can just kind of pick up and throw away when you're done. It's nice and easy. I only do a little bit at a time. You see there it's about, I don't know, three or four drops. Because if I accidentally do run my light over that and cure it, I don't want to waste a whole lot of resin. Uh, and I'll be try to be real careful so I don't. So first thing, I painted it. It's cured. I'm going to dip my brush in the resin. And I'm just going to put a light drop right on into the channel of the ring. And it literally is one, one big drop there. I don't want to do a lot. And the reason being, I want to create what I call creating a dam. So I, my brush still has a little resin on it. I'm going to just lean in and pick up a piece of abalone. And I'm just using the tackiness of the brush being wet with the resin to do that. Let me put my magnifiers on here. And I'm just using it as a way to pick up one piece at a time. And I'm going to set that right in there. So we'll see if the camera can pick that up. So that's one nice big piece of abalone. And then I want to look around at where my resin is in the channel. Because if I've got more resin in there that doesn't have any shell in it, I want to pick up another piece and put it in there because if I have resin in the ring and I cure it, that's going to be a hard chunk of resin. So if I go to put another piece on top of it, it's going to be raised up in the channel. Everything we do in the channel, we want to make sure it's below the surface. And the reason is 
uh, when we go to polish it, if it's above the channel, we'll have two problems. One, we'll have to uh, either use a, other tools or techniques because abalone shell is actually really hard. But more importantly, we'll lose some of our shine because if, the, if we cut into the shell, we're going to have that cut surface of the shell. Whereas if we have a clear on top of the shell, we're going to have that clear surface, which is shinier and it'll magnify our inlay, which is what we want exactly. So I'm just pushing these around to where I like the way they're sitting. And then I'm going to grab my light and I'm being careful not to hit my resin here. I'm going to point it kind of at myself and I'm just going to get onto that spot and cure it. And I wouldn't want to roll it when it's super wet, but relatively quickly, it's going to harden up. So now I can kind of roll it around. And I think the ring and the mandrel are reflecting the light onto my resin. So we'll see if this is going to work or not. I might have to reposition. Actually, yeah, I just cured. So just the reflection of the light onto my resin, I don't know if you all can see, but now I have a hard chunk of resin down there. But the most important thing is these pieces, you can see I'm hitting them. These pieces are now cured. So they're not so strong that I wouldn't have to do anything else, but they're going to hold perfectly until I go back to coat the ring. So I'm going to go ahead and prep a new little spot of resin here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some on the on this board here out of the way. So I can hopefully not get my light on it when I go to do this. So we'll see how good this works. But there again, I'm just going to dip it, pick up a little resin, put it on my ring. And now I call this first one that we did creating the dam. Now I can roll my ring back and work further around it without having my resin drip off the back as if it was still wet. So if you were doing this with CA or epoxy, you would have to wait till that cured, or you would have to try to use accelerator, which I think would create a lot of problems when you go to pick up other pieces or put new, new parts down. Uh, so the UV resin is really, really ideal for what we're doing here. And it was, uh, you know, it's kind of just discovered as a, an accident. We were using this for pen stuff. And then the ring stuff started to get a little more popular and we started making rings and it was like wow this works really good so there's three more pieces i think those are showing up pretty good now my resin's still wet so if i turn it too much those can slide off the off the channel there but those are looking pretty good i got some nice big ones there so that's good and i'm going to try to cure these without hitting my resin and you would want, if you were just curing this one spot, you would want to hold the light on it a little longer. But as I'm working my way around, I'm curing it back and forth, back and forth. And I'm kind of going over it over and over again to where I'm going to end up putting the light on this thing a lot. And now I'll go a little further. I go about a half inch at a time. So I'm just kind of, I wouldn't say filling the channel, but I'm putting a bed of resin down. And then I'll kind of dab into here to pick up a cool piece. Set it right in there. Pick up another piece. And one thing you got to keep an eye out for when you're doing this is not all, you know, abalone's a natural material. So not all of them are what we want for the ring. Like I just picked up one that's, it's really dark and it kind of just looks brown. Like maybe it was that part of the shell that, you know, where it bends. Actually, I flipped it over and it looks great. So that's what you got to do. Um, but if you find a piece that's just not up to snuff for what you're doing, you know, just pull it out of there. You can use the brush or the little picker or even a toothpick or something and just pick it right out of there. Because the worst thing is to get a really cool ring done and then have one spot that's just not up to snuff for what you, what the rest of it is. It really can drag it down. But I'm just kind of using now this this brush is giving me a little fit because it's got that cured gel on it. So I'm gonna see if I can brush some of that off. Uh, 
I had my, my thin one here. Oh yeah, that's much better. The stiff brush is a little difficult. Oh yeah, see, and I can, I can really pick and choose. And, you know, honestly, it kind of makes you feel like a more of a jeweler when you're doing this because you can, you're almost placing stones like in a setting, but you're just placing them in a channel. But I can really see if I get up here with my magnifiers, I can really see this well and I can move these around to where they almost fit like a puzzle, even though it's just a natural material. Now, the other thing I like to do when I'm moving the, the pieces around Sometimes you'll get little bubbles in the resin and it's just from dabbing the resin on the table or whatever container and then dabbing it into there. You just kind of introduce some air. So use your brush to pull those bubbles out. You can't necessarily pop them because once they're in the resin, you know, it's, it's a heavier, thicker material and it's not really going to pop, so to speak, but you can actually pull the bubble to the surface with your brush and then uh, get it out of the way for you. So again, just dabbing it and this this process really once you've done this even a couple of times, it goes really fast to where you're like wow i'm already done and I was kind of having fun placing all the pieces and making it fit right and look right. So you'll end up making several of these just because it's kind of a fun process there's a nice big white piece. So that's a real pearly piece. And I just want to look at that since that's such a large chunk. I want to make sure it's not above the surface or on the bend of the ring where it's going to stick out and it's looking good. So I got to make sure when I cure it that it's in the right spot, but it looks really cool. And the beauty with so many pieces of shell is you can kind of stir it around. If you need bigger pieces or smaller pieces, you can find exactly what you need. And they just fit right in there. And you'll see me dabbing. I'm just dabbing the tiny, tiny tip of my, my uh, brush to have some resin on it. And that helps me pick up the pieces. I used to use uh, tweezers and it worked fine, but it was a lot more time consuming and frustrating because those tweezers do not like to hold little thin parts. Uh, if the piece is bigger, it's okay, but thin stuff did not work well. So the, the wet brush, really works good for me so it may work well for you too all right now what i'm going to do is i've got a piece here on the end that basically is sitting on the dry part of the ring so i'm just going to go back here and get a little resin and put it right in the middle and that resin will kind of spread out into the middle of those pieces and i want to check my big piece here looks good so i'm going to go ahead and cure And you can see even just, you know, walking through this while I'm talking here, I'm almost all the way around. I've got about, well, maybe not, maybe a third left. So it happens fairly quickly, especially with these bigger materials. If I was using only the small stuff or the crushed opal, it might be a little more time consuming because you're laying a lot more of the little pieces in. Uh, but it, it still flows pretty nicely and works out pretty well. So it's exactly the same process. Some of these abalones have such good blue and purples to them. They're really neat. So I'm just kind of peeking into the, the barrel here to find the right ones. And one of these jars, depending on how many of these rings you end up making, I've made, I don't even know how many of these hundreds and these jars last forever because there's so much shell in here. It's two ounces, which when you're using a few grams at a time, it's unbelievable how long it lasts. But you can also use it for inlaying on bowls or pens or anything else. So I'm gonna get a little more resin, kind of drip it onto all those pieces. So it, what it does is it kind of helps them flow and lay flat. If they're too dry, it's kind of a fine balance. If they're too dry, they won't lay flat. If they're too wet, they'll slide all around. So you gotta find the, the delicate balance of it all. Now I'm going to go ahead and cure those. Those were some larger chunks. And see, as I rotate it, you know, I'm just curing these same spots over and over again. So I may not be curing each spot very long at, at each time, but over the course of making this, I'm curing the, 
the whole ring over and over again. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to get enough time of, of curing. Now I'm kind of nearing the end here. So I'm going to actually fill the whole rest of the way in. I'll find some really good pieces here. I'm just looking for that extra shine. Some of these shells have such good shimmer. There's a good one. And you, you are looking for like, you're making your own puzzle because, you know, pieces might go right or left and then have to fit in or interlock. And they're thin, so you can slide some underneath each other, which is really good. And that looks really cool. What's your favorite material to work with? Uh, you, for rings, it's it's abalone and watch parts. And I'm a, I don't know if anyone's familiar. I, I make a lot of watch part pens, or I have in the past. And I, for some reason, vintage watch parts just are cool to me. So even though the pens don't really make sense, they're just uh, in there, sitting there. I just like the way it looks. It's mechanical. And I would say the same thing for the the ring. You know, at a glance, it looks cool, but then when you start looking, you're like, oh, wow, there's little gears and little rods and bolts and stuff in that ring, and you kind of don't really expect it. So it it's just one of those things that isn't expected, so it kind of looks cool, and I dig the parts anyway. So, so I'd have to say watch the gears so that they fit in the groove, or? Yeah, so the, the watch parts, I'll actually uh, either cut them or grind them. A lot of times I'll, I'll cut them in half and then alternate them so they kind of interlock. And it's funny because it's one one gear, but it looks like two gears coming out of the walls and, you know, stuff like that. So you can really make it look cool in a little tiny area, which is not easy to do. So it's fun when you get it to look that good. So now I've gone all the way around. And I'm just going to give this an extra second here while I rotate it. And what I'm doing is I'm also looking with my glasses to make sure I don't have any big voids or spots I missed that I think I need to put something. And if I did, this would be the last chance because what I'm going to do next is fill it up. So I'm just rotating it and looking at it for that. Now, hopefully you guys can see the edge of this ring has got black paint all over it. Now it has resin. It's kind of a mess, but that's all going to be irrelevant here soon when we get to the lathe. So once you're happy with your fill, uh, and I'll just say fill because, you know, abalone or whatever stone, um, it's not going to be filled up to the surface. So when you're, when you're doing this, your, your sides are going to be here and your resin is going to be down here with your shell or your stone or whatever. You actually want to make it a little bit proud of the edges. And the reason being is when you go to sand this or turn this, if you're flat or under, you're going to have low spots. You're going to feel it in the ring. It's not going to, you're not going to be able to polish it. So if there's a little divot in the ring or in the resin, you won't be able to polish it. It'll be a dull spot. So all those little things will uh, not make it look as good as it could. So I always try to fill it to where the edges are here and it's just a little bit raised and that allows me to sand it flat and really get a nice even coat on it. So what I'm going to do is put out a little more resin and I'm going to go around this and kind of basically get big drops on my brush and I'm going to lay them on the thing and roll it. And I'm just going to carry that resin all the way around it and the tension of the, the sides will kind of make it bow up like that a little bit. And that's exactly what you, what I like to have happen. So that's what I'm gonna go for. So I'm gonna put a little more resin out here. And the cool thing, you guys probably already thought of this, but when I'm done with this resin, I just hit it with the light and it's cured. It's not a mess that I have to worry about, you know, putting my finger in later or something. Uh, I can just cure my spot and I'm done. So, all right, I'm going to get a nice big drop on here. I don't want it dripping off like that, but pretty close. And I'm just going to apply. And I just want to, I want to do about a third of the ring at a time. So you can see that drip just dripping on there. And I'm just really filling the whole ring 
if I wait too long, it'll definitely, whoop, that's a good example. I'll show you here in a sec. So I, I just slop some on the side, but we'll fix that. So I'm gonna cure this and I've got about a third of it really full and I've got a big old bubble of resin there. You guys can maybe see. And that's because I didn't move quick enough, but I'm just gonna go around this ring a couple of times and fill it in because I want my channel nice and full and that's what will create my really clear, nice looking ring. And I'm chasing a bubble right here. So there's a bubble in the resin. I just got to get it to the, to the edge and it'll go away. But, so I'm going to rotate this, kind of just brushing as I go. I just want to keep it moving so it doesn't clump up in one spot. And this process would be exactly the same uh, if I was doing opal or anything else, watch parts, stones, uh, it doesn't really matter. You just want it in the channel and below the surface is my main goal. So I've got a little low spot right here. So I'm just putting a drop in there and then I'm actually going to just cure that spot because it was kind of in between two high spots. So get that. And the other thing, if you have access or have a uh, UV nail curing, either station or a little uh, setup, you can use that for this. I have one on my uh, workbench and I'll pop the rings in there when I'm, I usually do a couple at a time and I'll pop one in there while I'm working on one and then I take it out and that way it's nice and hard and cured in between rounds of resin. So I don't have to worry about it being soft. Okay, so I, I must have flashed my, pile here, my resin pile. So I'm just going to put a couple drops out because I don't need much. All right, let's find my low spot. So you, you can dab it around like that. It's really nice, but you just got to be careful not to churn it and put air into it. That's the main thing. So when I think I'm done, I want to rotate it and look to make sure I don't have any of those low valleys. Uh, maybe right there. And it's these little details that'll, not only does it look better in the end, but it'll really save you time. If, if you find a low spot later and have to come back, you're kind of starting back in this phase where you got to get everything out if you put it away. So I take the time to make sure that my, my ring is really full, I'd say over full and it might save me time in the end. Ultimately, it's about detail and quality. You don't want a something that you're giving away or selling or even wearing yourself. You don't want it to be low quality because it's a reflection on who made it. All right, so that looks pretty good. I'm pretty sure I'm well over the channel all the way around. So in this case, I would, you know, living in Arizona, we have endless sunlight. Only about, not all year, but about 364 days a year we have sunlight. So um, I would normally set this outside, but what I'm going to do is just use my two flashlights here and I'll cure this real quick. And I'm done with this so I can cure my table, which I had kind of pre-done, but you can see now it's not tacky anymore. So in an in ideal situation, I think leaving it out in the sun for five or 10 minutes is best. Um, the harder, the more cured it is, the better it'll turn and polish. So by giving it that extra few minutes, it'll really pay off in the long run. Because um, the ultimate goal here is clarity. So you can see I've been using this mandrel the whole time. So this isn't what the mandrel was intended for. It was intended for the lathe, but you know, I don't have the most petite fingers. So holding this ring, if I was trying to do all this and hold the ring would be kind of a pain. Now you can of course turn, you know, turn a cone or something to do it and that would work just fine. But if you're gonna have the mandrels, it really is a nice way to do it. So when I'm done here, I wanna feel the, the resin and I'm looking for two things. One that, you know, it's full and two that it's cured. Now. Resin can be tacky, but not soft. 
So if it has a little surface tack, that's okay. But if it's soft, like if I push on it and the resin actually gives and moves, it's not okay. It's not done. So what I'm going to do is just, and that this is this is done, I think. But I'm going to give it a little, just an extra minute because I think you guys are worth it, and you're going to get this thing. And we appreciate that. <laughs> Whoever gets it, we'll see. Chad, what is the shelf life of the of the resin? You know, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I can tell you that when I first started doing using the UV resin about a year and a half ago, I bought a big one thinking, oh, you know, this stuff will go quick. But it seems like I never even dent the jug. Uh, now, these are the size we sell, these little quarter pounders. I think I got a one pound, and I'm still using the same one, and uh, – it works perfectly, so it hasn't gone bad. I figure one day it'll just stop working uh, when it expires, but I think maybe because they're in the dark bottle and there's nothing happening to it, maybe it's fine. I always am real diligent about keeping the lid tight. I would say try not to buy anything you don't use in six months or so, but if you keep it in a cool, dry place, um, I can tell you from experience it'll last a long time, but I, I'll find out that because I don't know the answer to that. Typical you know, typical resins, like a typical alumilite resin, clear, clear, slow, they're urethanes, and those have about a 90-day shelf life, real short. And epoxies have typically a year shelf life, but I, there again, I don't recommend using them for longer than six months because you'll start to get odd things happening. But uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to find out the answer. Now, real quick, I'll show this because this one's ready to go, but if I was going to do, oh, I'm having a little trouble getting this off, and I think the reason is, if anyone saw me, I dripped some UV on the side of this. Where is it? it feels really open up and pop loose. Yeah, so I got a little UV in there. Now it cured, obviously, which is good. But if it wasn't cured, I would definitely want to cure it. And especially on the, the metal mandrel, it'll pop right off. Trying to wipe it off wet is going to make a mess. Always cure it and then just chip it off, especially on anything metal, your lathe or your mandrel or anything like that. Now, if we were doing opal, and we'll just do a little quick section here. Um, I'll do this blue color so we can see it real easily. If we were doing opal, we would do exactly the same thing. But opal, it's a little more, your brush technique is a little more important. So I'll, I'll wet it just like before, start with one drop, create that dam. And then I'll, I'll get a little bit of opal on here. And now opal is much, much finer. It's more of a really crushed material. But what I'll do is I lay it kind of sideways into that drop and I roll the brush. I don't know if you can see it, but almost all of that opal came off perfectly. And now I can kind of push it around in there and it really fills in nicely. I think it's just the action of having the, the wet surface. And then by rolling the brush into that drop, it just allows me to roll all that chunky opal right off of there. So that is pretty quick on how you do opal and opal is really cool. Cause you can, you can pack it in there. I like to really shove it together and push it up tight because it looks really cool when it's thick and heavy because opal just has an amazing shimmer. So that's a little chunk of opal inlaid. But that, that's why the brush is a little more important on that than the abalone. The abalone, we're just using it to kind of pick up pieces, whereas the opal, it's a lot of powder, a lot of material. It's like the, it's like the consistency of salt. So imagine trying to pick up one grain of salt would be a little tough. But you can see that opal shines really cool. I'm gonna Is go that the same it. with the uh, like the different sands and the different crushed stones? Yeah, exactly the same. Um, and it, there again, it depends on the level of crushed. Like at our store, we have powder, small grain, and large grain. The large grain is fairly large. The small grain is about like like salt, and then the powder is literally powdery. And the reason we have three of them is to uh, 
The reason we have three of them is because if you were like doing a bowl and you had a crack, you might want to put powder behind it and then put the larger stone in front of it because you want to be able to see the grain of the stone. And the powder just looks like a colored fill, but it's nice to put the powder in first and then the stone on top of the chunkier stuff because then you get, uh, you can see the actual pieces. It looks really cool, but it, the color is solid. So you can do the exact same thing on the ring. A lot of times we'll take bigger pieces of opal or abalone and we'll kind of put glow powder or stone powder behind it or in the corners to fill it in, but not take over the whole thing. So it's kind of the secondary color. Now this, the black that we painted is the secondary color. So we don't really need uh, anything behind that. So what I'm gonna do is put this on the lathe now. Uh, I'm using the Record Power Herald, Herald lathe. This is a one and a quarter thread. I typically use my Beal chuck. Um, the Beal collet chuck is my favorite. I think it's the most precise uh, versus some of the like cheaper models, uh, like the Penn State chuck. It's fine, we sell it here. It's a lower price, but it's just not as precise. The Beal is really good quality. This is for my little Laguna lathe over there, but it's a one eight. This is a one and a quarter. So I'm going to actually use a Morris taper collet. So it's quite wobbly and whatever, but for a ring, it's not super important. How we set this up. Oh, get some focus here. Okay, there we go. Is we put the chuck in the lathe and then we put the mandrel into the chuck. The mandrel is a one half inch shank. It just slides in there and then you would lock it down. Ideally with a wrench, but I don't have one with me. And then your ring goes onto your mandrel. The mandrels are all stepped by sizes. So you want it on the largest size that's comfortable. I mean, that was fairly snug. I don't want to try to move it to the next one. I'll damage the ring or the mandrel. Um, the other thing is, like I talked about that, that bolt that goes in the end. Half the time, I don't even use the bolt because it's that spring loadedness is so strong and I'm just gonna be sanding. If I was turning, I probably would want it, uh, but I'm just gonna be sanding, so I'm not even worried about that. But I just want a good tension. Now, if this moved at all or was at all loose, I would definitely put the bolt in and tighten it. The thing you have to be careful of is if you're doing ceramic rings, uh, Ceramic is really, really tough, but if you put force on it going out, you can crack it. So ceramic, I never use the bolt. Steel, tungsten, titanium, you're not gonna ever break the ring, but you just don't need to sometimes. If you do, do, if you don't, don't. The other thing is half sizes. So these mandrels are all stepped sizes, but sometimes it just doesn't fit quite right. What I like to do is take plumber's tape and wrap it around the mandrel and slide it on there. And just a couple of wraps can be enough to change the size and it makes it really easy. And then plumber's tape, you don't have anything sticky or gooey and it comes right off. It, if, you know, if you catch a little bit when you're sanding or turning, it won't hurt anything. So plumber's tape is a great thing to use on that. Now, this is pretty much ready to go. I wanna have my tool rest moved out of the way, uh, my banjo, and I'm gonna take my tool rest off because I just don't need it. I like to put water under the piece, um, especially, I, I don't want to get my lathe all wet. We have a dedicated uh, sanding lathe that gets wet and we don't have to worry about it. But for the demos, I use this one, so I don't want to get it wet. I find these tubs work really nicely because you're going to throw some splatter and these will kind of catch it all. I'm going to start sanding with 600, but I'm going to use 600 first and then 800 and here's the key with these um you could easily put a tool up here and turn it especially like a round carbide or something would be no problem you're really taking off hardly anything so it might speed you up a few seconds or a couple minutes even but there's a lot more chance for damage or catching the edge or doing something so i just prefer to sand now the reason i start with eight, uh, 600 is I don't want to scratch this thing. So imagine I've got my channels and I get it sanded flat and I've got 220 or something. If I put scratches below those channels, 
I either have to keep sanding into that channel to get those scratches out, or I can't get them out. Um, I've had customers come in who just were really frustrated and they said, why do my rings look hazy and yours look clear? I do exactly what you tell me. And when we boil it down, it's always sandpaper. They do this process or they turn it or whatever, and then they, they grab like 120 and sand it. And 120 may not sound aggressive, but for this, it's like Armageddon because it's, it's digging down in there and it's below the surface of those, those channels where you'll never get it back. So I start with 600. This is the most aggressive I'll use on this. If I needed more than 600, I'd probably use a tool and turn it down. So that's why I do this. So I've got just water in here. I run the lathe about 800. Get some focus here. And I'm just gonna sand this thing flat. You can kind of hear that, da -da 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 -da. that's that droplet that I talked about. I have a big drop on there. And what you're gonna see is the white from the resin. So that's just the resin and water mixing. So you want to keep it nice and wet. Keep it moving. You don't want to sit in one spot. But this resin does pack the sandpaper pretty well. So if you don't keep it wet, it'll get full or it'll just stop working. So I, I rinse it a lot. You'll see me dip in this a lot and keeping it moving. And I can already feel that and hear that that drop going away that bubble of resin I had. And all this white on my finger and on the paper, that's all the resin getting sanded. Where do you get your sandpaper or what kind of sandpaper? Is that just regular wet sandpaper? Yeah, so this is automotive wet dry. Um, I'm not trying to plug Turner's, but obviously it's from Turner's Warehouse because it's right. Turner's Warehouse, if you don't know, my shop's here. Turner's Warehouse is right there. It's, we're all in one connected building here, so I can get my supplies right there, but it's automotive wet dry. Uh, I'd stay away from like Harbor Freight wet dry. I tried it and it tended to fall apart. The grit would just come off on everything. It was not good. But if you've got any kind of auto body shop, you can usually get wet dry sandpaper for less than a buck a sheet and a sheet will last you forever because you just cut it into strips. But we have packs that are 600, 800 because I always talk about that. And then you can get 600, 800 individually as well. So just use a quality paper because the, the cheaper stuff, the, the allure of the cheap doesn't, you know, once you start it's coming off in your hand, it doesn't seem like it was made to get wet, even though they call it wet dry. Um, just no good. But yeah, you see all that resin on there. And the other thing to take note of here, I should have showed you this at the beginning. This thing's pretty ugly. You can see the black on the edge and there's like clumps of resin. This thing's gonna come out really cool. So kind of take note of the, the way it looks now. So when we get there, we can appreciate it a little bit. But, um, and the other thing is always wet. Even pens, even wood, uh, wood pens and stuff, except for bowls. Anything I do pretty much on the lathe like this, small stuff, I wet sand everything. I just think it's better. I think getting the dust away or the debris away from it is important. And then the big thing with resin is temperature. Water will just help keep you from marring your finish with heat. So I, I've kind of worn that piece out. I'm gonna grab the 800 now. Even though I'm not all the way flat, the 800 will finish this off really fast. And you can hear it, it's sanding pretty, pretty well. But what you'll start to see in the in the camera is these sides will start to get really shiny and that black will start to go away because what the black is is the, the paint that I've got on the top of the channel on the sides. And once that starts to go away, it starts to really, really shimmer and it looks really cool. So you might have to change out to a couple pieces of sandpaper, but it's really not much in terms of how much you're actually using. Rings don't take a lot of resources. They don't use a lot of resin. They don't use a lot of material. Uh, for example, the little, the little opal bags we sell in one gram, it hardly looks like anything. When you get it, you're like, that's one gram. It'll do three rings, no problem. And I'm talking packing them in there. Unless, of course, you're doing size 17 or something huge. Normal rings, it'll do three, no problem. So a little goes a long way with rings, which is really nice. What's the biggest size ring you'll sell? 
Uh, we have some 17s and some 18s. Which we have one guy that works here who wears the 17. That's why we have him. And he has quite a few nicknames because of those fingers. He was doing a demo a couple weeks ago and somebody said, you know, sure, you picked the big, the guy with the biggest fingers to show the, the smallest detail work, which he was cleaning a chuck. And it was pretty funny, but the guy who called him out also had the sausage fingers. So it was pretty, pretty appropriate. But yeah, 17 is a huge ring. The average, uh, the average guys probably nine, 10, 11, the most common. Uh, ladies is like six, seven, eight. So if you want to practice, those are great sizes to make. If you don't, if you're not making it for anyone in particular, those are really good sizes because a lot of people wear those. Of course, if you're, you know, doing an art show or something, they're going to walk up and love the ring, but it will never be the right size. So you'll want to take orders and things like that. All right, can you start to see those sides cleaning up? They're starting to get a little shinier and shinier. I'm gonna get a new piece of paper. I just tear little like one by one squares and I just go across the paper back and forth. I'm okay with burning a few of these little pieces because it's just not much. And I can almost tell now what you might've just saw the black, you know, what I'm going to get is now black water instead of white water, and that's because I'm going to be getting into the paint really well. Uh, you can kind of see the gray on my finger. So now I'm getting the paint off, and that's when it'll really start to clean up. And I'm going over the whole surface here. I'm not afraid to hit the sides. Uh, I could even go on the sides if I thought I had debris or anything on there. Um, but all I'm going to do is shine up this stainless steel. I'm not going to hurt it a bit. Now there's black all over my ring and that's the paint. So this is, this is a good, it's a good sign when you see that because it means you're, you're almost flush to your ring, which is exactly what you want. So if I stop this, what I look for, I kind of put my fingernail along the edge here and I'm just running it. And this gives me an idea. I've got a little paint sticking out right there. So I just need to sand a little more, but I'm really close on the rest of it. Oh yeah, and the other side, we got a little bit right there and a little bit right there, but then the rest is really clean. So that could be my, my call it Chuck not being perfectly straight, but it'll come off really, really fast here because we're pretty much almost flat. Well, funny, funny story. I, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Arizona, but there's a little town on the border down by Mexico called Bisbee. And I love going to Bisbee and there's a lot of ghost stories down there. And, I was down at this uh, particular little hotel a couple years back and they, they were renovating. And in this particular hotel, there was said to be like 16 ghosts from some shootouts and murders and things. And I said, hey, can I get a piece of wood? Because I make pens and it'd be cool to make pens out of some haunted wood, you know? And uh, I'm not one to really buy into it, but I got back and weird things would start happening at my shop. Like I'd just be up in the front and the radio would turn on in the back of the room randomly. I'd go turn it off, come and say, turn it back on. And like the, the thing turning off here and uh, the bathroom door would just close. And it wasn't a door that normally moved. So I was kind of like, yeah. So I made the pens out of the wood and I sent them back to the Bisbee house. And I was like, hey, these are for you guys. And nothing, nothing ever happened. So it sounds crazy. Please it don't sounds send crazy. them back, keep them. What's that? Please don't send them back. You can have them. Yeah, that's what I said, basically. I said, uh, hey, these are for you guys. You can have them or give them to your, your customers or whatever. But, uh, you know, it sounds crazy when everyone else says it, probably like I sound. But then when it happens, you're like, huh, interesting. So that was my, my haunted wood. All right. So this is looking pretty good. What I'm gonna do is just kind of go on, I'm just kind of angling my finger here on the edges to make sure I don't have any, any resin buildup or residue. It feels pretty smooth. The other thing I like to do, get your finger, thumb or finger wet and just let it rotate. And if there's any divots, like depressions in the ring, anything down or anything high, you'll feel them. Even if you can't see them right away with your, your eyes, your fingers will pick up on them. 
because it's moving. Uh, and this feels perfectly smooth. So what you'll see there, doesn't that look better already? Oh yeah. Really cool. That stuff just, I mean, I always say, you know, when we turn wood or resin, nature always wins. Nature makes the coolest stuff. And so the abalone shell is a perfect example of that. We could make all kinds of cool resins that look great, but then this wins. So um, that's, that's pretty much that. So I want to examine that real quick. The line looks really clean. I don't have any resin or residue on the sides. It's perfectly ready to go. So that was my 800. That's where I stop with sanding. And now I go to polish. I always would say for this polish with whatever you're most comfortable with. If you use micro mesh for pens and it works great for you, use that on this. I'm going to use Zona paper. What Zona paper is, if you're not familiar, it's a product made by 3M and it comes in these eight and a half by 11 sheets. There's six sheets and it's like a, it's like a heavy paper, it's like a cloth back. And I cut it into strips. You know, Zona might not be on that, where I put a collection of all this stuff. I don't remember if I put Zona, it might be on there, but. Um, so I cut it into strips and then I cut off about a one inch square. Now, I use this on my acrylic pens and I, this is all I use. I don't use polish afterwards or anything. I'll use this on a four or five different pen tubes. On rings, I only use it once on rings. And the reason is we're, we're polishing metal and the metal will get into this. You'll see this this nice green will be kind of dingy and brown and black by the time we're done. And that's just the metal fibers getting into this. So I only use Zona once on rings. Now, if I had used it on a pen, I would still use it on a ring and then that would be it. But we're just gonna use that. I'm gonna leave it about the same, about 800. I go through the stack and when I'm using it over and over again, I just rotate it. That way I keep them in order. Uh, the last grit here, so to speak, is white. And it's really hard to tell the front or the back if you flip it over. So I try to keep them in order. Um, these go from 30 micron, from one micron, 30 micron to one micron. The white is one. So that's the equivalent to about 15,000 um, if you were talking grit. Now, micro mesh goes like to 12,000. So you can see already the black. And that's not paint, that's the metal. If you've ever done any metal work, you'll know like sanding or polishing metal makes it all dark and dingy. And it's that metal fiber. This is the same reason if you've ever made a pen and you sanded it with the bushings on and you got gray on the end of your pen, it's not the sandpaper or the wood, it's you're pulling metal into the fibers of the wood. And that's why you don't sand with your bushings on. It's the same exact story here. See how black that is? That's the metal. But what you're going to see, even in the video, this is pretty bright and shiny on the sides, but it's going to get really bright and shiny. So that's probably good with the green. There's no time to follow. It's kind of just feeling it out and seeing how much more you need to uh, with each grit or each step. Now I do try to go a slight bit longer with each one as I go on. And the reason it's kind of like sanding, you know, you got to sand out the previous ones, even though we're not sanding, it's kind of that theory. And you'll see me kind of pinch the ring with my fingers here. I'm using my fingernail to get the, the pad right up on the edges because I want to polish the whole ring now, not just the inlay. So I just like to keep it wet, go back and forth. And I'll start to gradually see the sides here get shinier and shinier and shinier. And by the end, it'll it'll be really bright and shiny. Although the light's dimming in here because my sunlights are fading. All right. Now, some people will do this and then they'll do two or three of these pads, the first three grits, and then they'll go to a buffing wheel or something else, which is fine. You know, find what works for you. This, to me, it's hard to beat zona paper with anything okay right there it just started to really pop and shine this color look how black that is and it's funny because you can tell it's that because i'm holding it and the sides are really getting black and it's lighter in the middle <laughs> where the little resin is 
And you do have Zona paper on your website for the uh, Ring demo. Oh, good. It's hard to remember everything ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, Zona paper is, is my favorite. A, a friend introduced it to me a couple of years ago. And I think at the time I said, I'm good, MicroMesh works fine. And then I use it and I was like, all right. And that, that's all I've ever used since. So I don't know why, it just, for me, it works really well. It flows nicely. I think I like the fact that I can squeeze it and pinch it around stuff. Whereas MicroMesh, you know, the pads are a little harder to, to maneuver because they're stiffer. Um, I like that my fingers are feeling this. And and I, I see on the on your website you do have uh, one that just says it's a divided titanium core that doesn't have any sides so how are yeah, you can you explain that one yeah so there's there's basically two types of rings you'll see on their uh, channel which is what we're doing here and then the other is that we essentially call them flat tops or or flat comfort rings those are the rings that you would put the the wood or the resin on the outside, essentially you're gonna cut the hole for the ring, inset the core so you have a nice sturdy core, and then you do the whole thing on the outside. It's kind of a different animal because you're, you're boring out your blank, putting the ring in and then turning the outside. Now that's a lot more turning. And the divided core specifically, those are, those are probably the most difficult. Those are made to have two types of material on the outside so you've got your core and then you've got a ring around the center sticking up like basically like one of these channels in the center and you could put two types of wood on it it's kind of cool like if you were doing uh, you know like you might do a couple of whiskey woods or if you're getting married and there was like significant woods to the family you could kind of blend the two uh, to make something cool you could do a resin in a wood so really you can do anything but it's a little trickier because you're you're essentially cutting out of the blank that exact size of whatever size ring you're making, fitting it in there, then turning the outside. Mm, okay. So not impossible and not hard, but it just takes a little practice. Are you still using the resin to put it on? On the, like the flat top rings? Yes. No, typically I use CA, uh, thick CA or two part epoxy because I'm you're basically gluing the core into the other material and it's fully covering the surface of that core. So whereas the channel you're just inlaying this this little bit into the channel, the other type you're you're inlaying the core into the ring. And I do have a video exactly showing how to do that on YouTube if you guys want to see it. Um, it's not a hard process. It just takes a little practice. But that allows you to make some really cool rings because you don't have any metal on the edges. You just have either wood or whatever material you chose for it. And there again, you can inlay that into wood or resin and then cut a groove in the center. Like I've done one where I cut a groove in the center of the wood and inlaid a bunch of cubic zirconia stones all the way around it. And that was really cool. So it allows you to do a lot of cool things. All right, you guys ready to see what this looks like? So I'm on my final one here, the white. And this is the one I'll spend the most time on because this is what will give my, my ring the, the ultimate shine. Now, what's really cool about these, if you, know, if you have somebody, like I have somebody who bought one of these from me a couple of years ago, and he came in and he's like, hey, I wear this every day, it's a little dull. It had just been scratched up and you know worn over time. Still looked really good. I just essentially painted a new layer of UV around it to fill in any scratches, uh, fill it up again. And then I just did this sanding and polishing process again, and the ring looked brand new. So after almost two years of wear, the metal had held up perfectly. There was no gouges, and I don't think it's super rough on it. Um, but it held up really well, and it looked really good. And, 10 minutes on the lathe, it was back to new again. So it's something I kind of offer. If somebody stops in, I'll fix up their ring for them and make it new again, if it's one I made. <laughs> All right, this thing's looking pretty cool. So I always hold this last piece of white uh, in my hand. <coughs> Excuse me. The reason being, I like to pop this thing off and I just want to kind of clean the inside. 
And this would just be if I had any glue or paint that I couldn't get when it was on the mandrel. And that white will kind of polish it nicely. And there is definitely, oh, I just popped it out. There was some resin from that drip I did earlier. There was like a dot of resin right on the inside of the ring, but it popped right out. The inside of these rings, I don't know if you can tell, but they're, they're shaped, they're curved. So they're, they're called comfort rings. So they're not like a sharp corner. You can see it's kind of smooth in there. But there is the ring. What do you guys, whoop, what do you guys think? Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Very nice. It looks really nice. So what can you tell us about the, the split rings that uh, Wildwood uh, sells, the kits? Uh, are they split? They're split cores that you put together? Yes. Uh, so we, we actually have a few of those left. We used to get those from uh, uh, JD up in Canada. He makes those. He makes a lot of our mandrels and stuff for us. And those are great rings, but there's a really steep learning curve. And a lot of people with rings, uh, if they grab the first one and it goes poorly, then they're done. So it's kind of a bummer to have that. So I'm actually not carrying those anymore. Once we sell out, we're done. And the reason being is, so imagine that ring is essentially this channel ring and then cut down the middle. So you've got this side and this side that go like this. You have to have your material cut exactly perfect this way and around the size because when you snap it together, if it's not right, taking it apart nine times out of 10, damage the ring. Like you'd, you'd mar up the edges or bend something or chip something. And it was always not good. So I found that most people struggled with it so much, it wasn't worth having them try it. Um, the, chan the flat channel cores are much easier and they yield almost the same results. If you want a channel ring, which is what those create, this is pretty good. Now, you might be saying, well, I want wood around it, but you can still do wood on these. You can do like bent wood techniques. You can thin wood really thinly and wrap it. You can cut wood and like interlock it. It's really cool. Um, I do these out of Fordite where I cut the Fordite and then I sand it really thin and it's almost like a rubber band. It's so flexible. And what's cool about that is you can line it up how you want and get cool patterns. So. Those rings are fine, and once you've done a few, they're not bad, but most people would do one and never want to do another one, or they'd be really upset because they're a little expensive. Um, the stainless steel that we had were around 18 bucks, and the titanium were like 25. So if you messed up your first one and it cost 25 bucks, you kind of had a bad taste in your mouth, whereas these are six, the flat tops are three. Obviously, you don't want to mess them up, but if you did, you're not out quite as much and they're much easier to get a good product right away whereas the other ones it almost seemed like it was too much effort for what it yielded when they came out good they came out good but it just was a different animal so nothing wrong with them they're just a little steeper learning curve and they're typically more expensive so hope that answers but that's uh that's the, the finished product there yeah, that guy Wildwood, he's been at SWAT um, for several years. Yeah, and so he's he's doing. I think he's he's always had somebody around his booth. It's very interesting. So, yeah, I I don't have any issue with him personally, but as a seller, it just wasn't to me. It wasn't good service to sell something to most people that would have trouble with it. Like there's pen kits that we've I've loved that I've stopped selling because uh the assembly was just too difficult or a part was easy to break in some way uh, if you weren't perfectly careful with it so to me it's just kind of i'm you know being a seller it's different than being just a maker so that's that's kind of why i don't have any issue with them and i would encourage you to try them because they're a lot of fun but just be aware of those details that you need to have both dimensions really close the first time because they're hard to do a second time so yeah but uh, so this will be, this is the ring I'm sending you guys. I'm also sending you a ultimate set, which is the stand I was using with the mandrels and the resin and all that. So I'm sending you guys that to do as a raffle for your next, uh, next meeting. So I hope you guys enjoy that. Fantastic. Any I will enjoy those. <laughs> all right. Any other questions for Chad? 
Well, thanks Thank again, you. guys. Uh, oh, if you have any questions, um, any questions at all, don't hesitate to ask. The best is to email Turner's Warehouse One at Gmail. It's on the front page of our website at the bottom. Email, call, Facebook is okay. I don't get to spend a lot of time on there, so don't expect me to answer right away, but I'll try to get to it. But any questions, we're here to help. Um, anything we can do to help your, your making pens or rings or resin work better, that's kind of what we do. One question on rings. I see them sometimes with wood rather than a, uh, an epoxy fill. Are those a two-piece uh, shell? Yeah, it's either the two-piece or the flat top or like the bent wood like I was talking about. Okay. Yeah, so you can do it a couple of different ways. Okay. Yeah. I saw I saw somebody one time use a uh, – they basically glued up a bunch, and then they used a, a plane and created a real small thin veneer and yep. wrapped it and glued it on. And that looks insanely cool because it looks like a segmented blank. I mean, it is, essentially. It's a segmented blank in this little tiny channel. I mean, there's nothing more precise looking than that. So that would be a great way to do it. And you could even cut it just a hair thicker. That way you could still line it up and get it wrapped and it would be nice and thick. But you would do that. You wouldn't, You might use the UV to cover it, but I would probably CA glue that in and let it cure without accelerator and then cover it in the UV. The UV resin is much better for a surface coat than CA. It shines a lot better. Um, it's probably hard to see on the video, but this thing just shimmers like glass in person. So when, when you guys get it, you'll see it's pretty shiny. Does it turn yellow? Uh, I haven't seen them turn yellow. I'm sure given enough time, they will start to yellow. But the thing about yellowing in resin, because we've done a ton of big pours and river tables and stuff, the bigger it is, the more likely you are to see the yellow. This is so thin that even if it yellowed, you might not be able to see it. And I know that sounds weird, but um, you can take a pen blank that's made out of alumilite. Alumilite, uh, clear, slow, or clear, if they sit under fluorescent lights, will turn yellow fairly quickly, a few months. They look yellow like a brick of yellow. You turn them, and you can barely tell there was any hint of yellow. And it's because you're turning it so thin, there's not much left, and there's just not enough material to, like, see the yellow i guess with our eyes <laughs> so so i think that's the the positive for these is the material so thin even if it gets yellow it probably isn't enough material to to be able to recognize it mm, okay. so it, the ones that we have that are old i mean they sit that sample block sits in our shop under the fluorescence and most of those have been there over a year and they look as good as the day we made them so that's pretty positive very cool well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. A lot of fun. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate your time, sir. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Something we're all going to try, I hope. Yeah. yeah. Peace, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Because we're starting to get into the Christmas season. Yeah. Uh, and start making stuff. So these are these are great, and I think I haven't been doing a lot of art shows lately, just because uh, time is short here at Turner's. But if I was still doing a lot of art shows, I'd have a, a nice display and I'd have every size in different things so people could try them on, know their size, and then pick their inlay. And a lot of times you want that impulse buy, but at the same time, if somebody knows you're going to custom make something for them, they get really excited about it and really into it. So it's kind of a cool thing to be able to do that. But I'd have an array of sizes so people could put them on, kind of fall in love with them, the way they look. You know, I'd have a, a four millimeter, a six millimeter, and an eight in each of the different materials so they could see how it looks on their fingers and, and all like that. And I think you'd sell a lot of rings. One, you have you, you have a ring sizing tool? Yeah, yeah, we do on there as well. Um, one of my, I did a live stream earlier and it was about rings and one of my pen customers who buys pen supplies said he sells five rings for every pen that he does and he sells a lot of pens so that means he's selling a lot of rings but the rings are you know depending on how you price them they could be a real quick purchase you know? especially looking like that yes. yeah i always tell people when they're in the store these look so much better than you think they should because they're not a lot of work and they come out really good and you're just like how does it look so good for that little of effort 
you know, I'm not demeaning our skills, but you know, these come out really good. So I hope you guys will give them a try. Uh, I have a question. You said you were using that uh, epoxy or that uh, resin fill for void, say in a, in a bowl blank or something like that, say a split, you put it in there. How thick can you lay that on and still have it cure with the light? Well, that's, that's the, actually the main point of that stuff. So you, you want it to be shallow stuff. So like maybe you've turned the bowl down to almost to size and you have a, a crack on the surface or a split or something, you can use it. If it's anything very deep, you cannot use it. And the reason being is that light has to get through it to, to cure the resin. And the other thing is you can't color it because color basically blocks the light. So if you're going to color anything or it's a deep pour, you want to use epoxy. Uh, but if it's something on the surface or you're just feeling like a hairline that you just cropped up right at the end, it works really great for that. What I use it for a lot is if I've got a rough spot um, on a pen or a bowl, maybe it's a side grain to end grain or something, um, I'll brush that UV resin on there and let it soak in, cure it, and then sand it, and it feels like glass. It's amazing. It's almost like a, a sanding sealer, only it does a better job because it fills in every nook and cranny perfectly. So it's kind of interesting. And we've done a lot of experiments where we've taken different woods and we brushed a bunch on, cured it and sanded it. And it's amazing how smooth it is, even though you can't really see it once you've sanded it off, it fills in every little grain line possible. So it's pretty cool stuff. But there again, it won't work for everything and deep bowl cuts, cracks, it won't work for. This is not a structural uh, component. I mean, if you want to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it could be if you could cure it, but the problem always is getting all of the resin cured. So you, you would have, you might cure the surface or even the first half inch, but as the light fades, as it goes in, if you know, if your crack was an inch deep, as it fades, as it go in, it's going to get weaker. So you might have a soft spot in the middle of it, which I've, I've done that where I thought I, you know, was in the acceptable range and I've, gone too deep and then I turned it and I'm like what's this splatter that got all over everything and it's the resin because I cured the first several layers and not the inside so if you if you use it to uh, fill in rough spots on the surface can you put a finish over it after that yeah absolutely yeah we've done lacquer and ODs and all kinds of different things trying it out on on the larger pores could you do it in layers put like you know like one millimeter at a time and just fill it in Oh, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, because it's all about that curing. So if you're curing it as you go, it would be fine. And it sticks to itself really well, as you'll see in the rings, because we're just coating it over and over on itself after we've cured it. Um, a lot of resins like Alumalite doesn't like to stick to itself or anything else. So you basically don't want to do layers because you'll have a defined line in the, in the cast. But this stuff, I mean, I would say it's made for small scale stuff, small thin cracks or or scratches. Um, I would always test it. So if you were using it as kind of a sealer before a finish, I would test it on a scrap to make sure it doesn't discolor it or change it in any way. Um, but it's worked out really well on a lot of things. There's some stuff I've found that I'm just like, eh, it's not the right tool for that. Very interesting. Appreciate yeah, it. a lot of fun. All right, well, thanks guys. Right. Thank you, Okay, Chad. we appreciate you your time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, right. Thank you sir. Thanks, Chad. Thank, Thank you, Chad. You.